Aloha, and welcome back to Think Tech Hawaii, Talk Story with John Wahee. Today, we have a most interesting guest. As for those of you who might be familiar with my political career, you would know that I uh, ran and held office as a, as a Democrat. But some of my best friends were on the other side of the aisle. And uh, what I've learned over the year, uh, over the years, is while we may have different perspectives on things, we all seem to end up in the same place, which mm. is doing something good for the people of Hawaii. So today, I'm very pleased to welcome as our guest Representative Jean Ward, who is the Minority Leader Emeritus, and what the the title of our uh, subject is The Other Side, the, the Republican Viewpoint, Getting Past Platitudes. So welcome, Representative. It's a pleasure to have you on the show. Thank you, Governor Wahe. It should be talk story with Governor Wahe, because first, John, I want to tell you, thank you for all your service to Hawaii, not only as governor, but when you started out in the legislature, no, even before that, in the Constitutional Convention, you were a pioneer on Hawaiian issues, and I know we still got a long ways to go, and we're working together on DHL to get those well, 28,000 housed. But thank you for all your service, and you're still now on the public eye. So, <laughs> well, I'm trying to be on the public Zoom, but not too much in the public <laughs> eye. But anyway, Representative, thank you so much. Uh, I wanted to begin by, and I want to be, get into what you're doing for Hawaiian Hope. But before we start, um, well, let's start there. What are you doing for Hawaiian Home? We, you know, after, you know, okay, okay, I've been in for 12 sessions. And like the first eight of those, all I heard on the floor for Hawaiian issues were, Pablum, we'll get back to you. Well, that's good. And so God, it was like anything that had to do with social, uh, cultural, or protocol issues. The Hawaiians were first up and running. When it came to political and economic issues, it's like, well, you know, we're not really ready for you yet. You know, you have to sit up. You're not at the table yet. And it, it got to the point where, hey, hey, guys, come on. This is the host, host culture. Uh, why, why are we giving all this lip service? So what I started doing was looking into what was going on with the promise that was made 100 years ago under the Hawaiian homelands. By and Prince Coheel. By Prince Coheel, who, when, when you do visit my office, Gov, that's going to be the first uh, four by four photo you're going to see and beautiful framed uh, a portrait of jo Jonah Coheel in my office. It was having looked at what was going on in paper. And then what I did, and this is probably the most enlightening part of it, I interviewed every living director of the Hawaiian Homes uh, Department. Oh, wow. Every one of the people who it, I interviewed, Totally dedicated, totally loved the idea, but they said, you know, the way that we've been funded and organized, it's just not working. So, Gov, I was very disappointed, but in the process of writing this book, well, handbook, I actually called Broken Promises, it pointed out some of the things that we should be doing. In Have you got a copy you can show us? Just uh, hold yes, it up. Fact, if I can pull back a second, I've got one right here. Your initiative is... Uh very worthwhile and to have somebody who is committed as you are uh, who even went so far as to put his findings in a uh, handbook would be uh, it, it is a very positive thing you know so it's, well, it's, just and it's, people can pick up pick yes. this handbook up at your office I'm at assuming. the office or they can call we can mail it but it's called broken promises and basically, it's what's going on for the last 100 years of promising, because there was 223,000 acres that were given, that Prince Coheel wanted to put the Hawaiians back on the land. And he, I don't want to get into the sovereignty issue, but you know this is a promise that was made because the Hawaiians basically had lost their land. And this was to put them back and rehabilitate them. But what happened when the statehood came, the the, the Congress, which was initially responsible, turned it over to the state of Hawaii. And you know, as governor, there was not a whole lot of money that, that came for the Hawaiian Homes Commission. But now, Whoa. after 100 years, we've got 28,000 on the wait list. 
And the sad thing is, after 100 years, when he put 9,800 on the You land. know, the sad thing is that you've got are those statistics. you got uh, 9,000 uh, 9, plus people mm -hmm. on the Hawaiian homestead land. They, they, and you got 28,000 people on the waiting list. You know what the silver lining in that is, though? I was thinking about it, and I was thinking, to the extent that you can call it anything, I, that the fact that you got 28,000 people who are qualified. Yeah. Still. And, and that says a lot, because as you know, when the, when the act began, most of the, not Kuhio himself, but a lot of the people who went along with him in putting it together just sort of believed that this was going to be a short-term measure. Eventually, nobody would qualify, and hence the blood quantum of uh, 50%. Mm. No, Kuhio wanted zero uh, blood quantum. I mean, if you're Hawaiian, you're Hawaiian. He, he didn't want yeah. to have, uh, you know, all of this 50%, which it is now. And as you're noting, it's being diluted to, to quite an extent. But we still got 28,000 people who qualify. <laughs> well, That's amazing. And in, in uh, 2000 and, and 2021. The projection is there's probably 50,000 qualified, 28,000 are on the list. There's probably another 20 some thousand that are out there. But the point is we are so slow at getting at it. And in any hearing, and I'm on the Hawaiian Affairs Committee, Judiciary Hawaiian Affairs, I asked uh, Bill Isla, the, the director, I said, Bill, well, give it, or was it the deputy director? When, given what you've said you can do, when will we clear the wait list? <laughs> you won't believe what, what he said. It was 2288. Oh, God. I said, By I that time, hopefully, we'll have 100,000 people who qualify. I mean, and, uh, my goodness. So, well, it's, you know, I, I, I know you, you put together a pretty good committee of individuals who've been working on this. I, I know that uh, you got some, well, you got a good cross-section. Well, well, it, uh, it's a steering committee, actually, uh, Gov. It's with uh, Ostender, Peter Apo, Peter Savio, who, you know, Peter Savio, he's a holy guy because his heart is more Hawaiian than some Hawaiians. I, I'm yeah. totally convinced he's so dedicated. In fact, he's almost done his own private I don't want to say DHHL private, but he's going to do, if he gets the land in Makaha, have it only for Hawaiians, only for 50% Hawaiians, and show how easily you can do a development if you get all the leadership and the variables lined up and you can do less than $200,000. So Peter's got a, a great heart for the Hawaiians. And people say, hey, Ward, you're a Haole guy, right? I said, well, I got a little bit of Chinese, Jewish, and other Haole related <laughs> stuff. Why are you doing this? And I said, you know, I'm an old JFK Peace Corps guy. And I used to quote him saying that, you know, we're not in the villages of the world because the Russians are there. We're trying to make friends for America. We're doing this because it's the right thing to do. And, well, and I was going to actually start movies. with this, you know, and, and begin with the. I, I don't think a lot of people out there know that when you're talking about JFK and going into the villages of the world, that you're an old Peace Corps volunteer. And that was Peace Corps trained in Hilo, Hawaii, Wainui Nui, uh, up in Waikiuka. And I'll tell you, that's a life-changing experience. But you go to those villages because it's the right thing to do. And doing these issues with the Hawaiians because it's the right thing to do. I Okay, I'm a faith-based guy, but I'm telling you, Lilio Kalani's prayer, Governor, are still active. They never had shelf life that has expired. So if there's going to be, at some point in the future... Justice and equality and housing and all the other things. I don't know when it is, but look, we're just trying to push the ball and advance it. And I knew you have been an ex officio member with Ostender and Peter Apo and, and Peter. Well, I, I have been privileged to be able to drop in from time to time and, and get briefed. And, and I've got to say, I appreciate your commitment. I appreciate your willingness to try new ideas and uh, just come full circle on that. Um, and anybody who who wants it, they ought to take a look at Broken Promises, which is your your handbook. And your office seems to be wide open to receiving any kind of input. So, oh, people, sure. if you got it, uh, take it to Representative Ward. And I, I want to tell you though, before we uh, before we uh, get too far down, 
uh, on this that uh, we, uh, I, I'm sure that, I'm sure the people that want, that are on the homesteads appreciate it. But you started out as a Peace Corps in Malaysia, right? Yes, and you were the honorary consul of Malaysia. Yeah, so. but I want to know where you met your wife, who is also Malaysian. I, she is a Malaysian, and because of the Isla Center, of which you and I sit on the board of directors, there's more intermarriage because of the East West Center than probably any other institution, at least in Hawaii, that I know of. I think 40 to 50 percent of the people who go to the East West Center end up, end up marrying oh, somebody. Oh, you met her at the East West Center? At the Japanese Garden. We actually, where Obama's uh, parents met. Uh, if you over, that's a beautiful place, Jefferson Hall, the Japanese Garden. I met, fell in love, and uh, that's been decades ago, quite frankly. So it's where those kinds of causes, if you will, I think are on the right side of history and, and Gov, you helping and kicking this off with an OHA as you are the progenitor of getting the Hawaiians, getting, as Peter Apu likes to say, getting more political muscularity in the Hawaiian community. <laughs> Not enough Hawaiians running for office. Gov, it's true. Yeah, yeah, it is. It. I, I, you know, I, wanna, I wanted to talk to you really, and, and this is good segue into that because uh, what is interesting to me is that you, as to as a member of the loyal opposition, mm. you are not only talking about what's wrong with a program, you're actually doing something about it. And I'm sure people appreciate that. And you're doing it about do going about it in a non in a nonpartisan way. I've never heard you try to take credit for any of this stuff. In fact, <clears throat> most of the time you're passing it around. Gov, you're very kind in your in your comments, but look, we're Americans first, we're Democrats second, or Republicans second, or third, or whatever. Uh, it's that, you know, we're supposed to be problem solvers, not for what you can get out of it, but what, in, in effect, when you're serving the people, what is the better direction to go? And we got a lot of problems. We've only mentioned one with the Hawaiian community and the housing and the other issues, but there's so many problems we keep kicking the can down the road with that... Uh, Partisan politics doesn't really have much of a, a say or a sway, even though well, let's you, it, you we're just a super majority. Back. We only got one party rule in Hawaii, basically. Well, yeah, that's true. And I think one of the weaknesses of our, and this is me uh, saying this as a, as a Democrat, and as I said to my Republican friends, unfortunately, not my job to increase their party, <laughs> but I, I wish that somebody would. I mean, really, I really wish that somebody would that we would create a, a, a much better opposition yeah. uh, party. I mean, we're uh, small, that, we're not dead, but but Gov, let's face it, in the beginning, 100 years ago, we owned everything and ran everything. All we've done is basically flip it around and now the Democrats own everything and run everything. <laughs> it's not well, tell, let, let me ask you this question, though. I have a couple more uh, uh, questions. We'll get ready to answer this question because we are actually got to go into a break. Oh, okay. And, and, and real shortly, but uh, you just came, and and this is a little bit of a curveball, but you just came back from looking at the uh, mass transit system. Yes, just a few minutes and, ago, in many fact. Yeah, and I was going to when we get back from the from the uh, uh, from the uh, the the commercial break. I uh, I was going to ask you whether or not uh, you had any ideas as to how that could get fixed. <laughs> <laughs> Just, you know, and if you don't, uh, the, you know, that's uh, really. Is this oh. a two-hour program? Is this a two-hour program or what? No, no. The, I need the short version. We're going to take a break okay. right now, and we will be sticker. right back. Thank you. 
Welcome back to Talk Story with John Wahee and my very special guest, Representative Dean Ward, who is Minority Leader Emeritus at the University, uh, the University of Hawaii. There you go. You got a PhD. <laughs> at the, <laughs> well, you're getting another PhD. So you just came back from visiting the, the rail. Tell me, just off the cuff, you know, I, I, I know that you could take up the next week talking about all the intricacies of that project, but just off the top of your head, what is, what is your gut feeling about it? You know, uh, Gov, it looks better on the ground kicking the tires than it does on all the stuff on paper. Uh, one of the reasons why I wanted to go out was to see what, in effect, they had actually there. And being that I rode the, the metro in Washington, D.C. when I worked at USAID under the Bush administration, I got to know pretty much how the ins and outs and the flows of the parking. I see, uh, for, let me start with some of the good impressions. The good impression I had was you can't fall in the tracks, you can't jump into the tracks in front of the train. Most mm. of the places have no guards. This is kind of like a tram wheel at the, at the airports. When the train comes, these doors open up and it lets you into the doors that are open in the train. I thought that that was impressive. Also, you can't jump over the turnstiles because they have also, uh, uh, how would you, opening and closing glass doors. I thought that was impressive. And the other thing, inside of the train, you can see from one end all the way four cars to the other. It's not like the old trains where you got to open a door to get into another car to open a door to get into another car. So it's roomy. It gives the impression of being very spacious. But I have a couple of problems. And one of the things I pulled out of my pocket, it was what you read and I read on Sunday's paper. Uh, David Shapiro wrote about a million dollar contract that was going to Miss Hanabusa. I said, enjoy a good friend from the legislature before. And he did an excellent job. He and his, he and his uh, uh, guides I said, Joey, is this true? You got a million dollar contract? Well, we only got an opener now for the first 18 months. So it's kind of like not as bad as it was made out in paper. And I think Gov, that's my overall impression. You go there, it looks like a very professionally well-organized thing. It doesn't look like the crazy history that we've been given and, and know about. But when he handed out the budget, it's still got a $3.4 billion red ink on the, on the projection. And that the is cost. scary. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> that is scary. You know that uh, Frank Foster and that I uh, work hard to bring uh, mass transit to Hawaii many years ago. It was the result of a bipartisan effort, you know, and it didn't, with Frank, it didn't matter what party you belonged to, just working with him would be bipartisan. Yeah, yeah, yeah you're, you're yeah. right. <laughs> and and, and uh, I wish we had done it then, but unfortunately we yeah. have to do it now. You guys uh, had the money right, you had the, the whole timing, but now, uh, but what seems to be the, the, the other problem is the, I didn't see enough parking incentives for people from the west side to drive to a place to be able to get parking or sufficient number of parking in order to get on the train to actually be incentivized to use it. So ridership is, is a concern. And then the last concern I have, which I was not assuaged of in any way whatsoever, is that the operational costs of, are going to be right. about 145, 150 million a year. And there's no way that that's going to happen. And I said, Joey, you know, it looks like without saying it, you guys are probably going to come back to the legislature and say, don't lift that 0 0.5, 0 0.0, yeah, point half a percent of a GT tax that we have. Oh, I, I, I believe it's, it, that's going to be permanent, don't you? I, exactly. And I think it's going to be dedicated to keeping that thing running. And that's probably yeah, what they and, may be. But, you know, I, my suspicion has always been that if we, even if we didn't have a real, I have never seen. I I I'm going go. <laughs> yeah, at least not here. Hey, but, you're yeah. suspicious as I am. Uh, but, uh, you know, but again, I, I remember uh, when Frank and I talked, you know, thought about the half percent. Uh, and and uh, which was way back when, but it, it, you know, at that time we were funding at best ten percent of the rail, and the rest was uh, you know federal money. Now, one of the things we have been having, one of my, uh, I've been having a series of guests uh, who are kind of unhappy 
with mm. the um, the public uh, public participation in the session. Now, some of that had to do with COVID, you know, just is in some of it, but some of it had to do with just the fact that they felt that issues were just being shut out. What what's the Republican viewpoint on on, on those kinds of issues? In fact. One of my guests, uh, Jim Sean, was talking about putting together a convocation of citizens to not deal with issues, but to deal with uh, getting more uh, daylight into mm -hmm. the convention set. I mean, not the convention set, the, uh, the legislature. But you, you know, uh, 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 Jim Sean is an old Peace Corps volunteer also. So we're all idealistic and very kind of aspirational. I can see how uh, we could do that uh, power of convening to get more sunlight. Uh, I found the great irony uh, when we didn't allow anyone into the Capitol unless they had a special invitation and mostly they were lobbyists. But I don't know if you know that since uh, speakers say we have invocations, we have you know a prayer at the beginning. So I had right. asked Kahu uh, Kurt Kekuna. Yeah. And I, I was suddenly told that, oh, no, he can't come in. I said, wait, you let lobbyists in? You can't let a pastor in? I mean, come on, give me a break. Oh, wait, what, what do you mean? You, they wouldn't let a pastor in? They, they wouldn't let anybody come in to say the invocation in the House of Representatives. Now, you know, CDC has got contradictory things that they've talked about. We, we've got it from... Uh, the why hey I mean the yeah the governor uh, his administration see I still see you as a governor. Uh, Thank you. We we don't we don't have consistency all the time. So when they say you know if you're a lobbyist you can come in as long as your name's on the list, and I'm thinking, I mean there's not no pure human being in the, maybe. Well, pure. you know that's that's for me that's I I you know that's bad optic that at, yeah at yeah yes now nobody knows and, about and, this. And, you I know think some of the audience. It's uh, I think it's just bad politics, period, because, you know, the legislature actually is a place where you could have uh, a, a faith based ceremony mm. and not run into uh, into trouble because it's kind of the uh, responsible for its own uh for its own procedure, you know. I know you're and, putting your legal hat on now, but remember there was the guy who was the head of the atheist who would cry out, "You, when there would be a prayer, you, you, you're offending my constitutional rights, or you're trampling on that." And one day he did that in the Senate, and he got tackled by a guy, and the Senate got sued for seventy-five thousand dollars. And now the <laughs> Senate has, the Senate doesn't have an invocation. Only speakers say when, I think it was. Uh, Kim Pine and myself made sure that, that we stayed with an invocation. And look, if they're not evangelical or they're not, uh, what do they call it? No, them? but you know, you can also have somebody like, uh, like Pono, like Pono yeah. Shim, talking about uh, the, the values of, of, um, of, a, of universal values that yes. are underlying, yes. uh, you know, our, our society. Well, I hope that that issue gets worked yeah. out. I mean, if you want well, that lobby, city council right. doesn't do it with the only guys who do it. But up to your general question about should we be opening up more? I think we have to be a model at the legislature. We should have slowly let things open a little bit more. I mean, we even closed the gates. You got to have a card to get into the parking lot. So I think if if we show that look, we're vaccinated, everybody's vaccinated, everybody feels a little bit more comfortable. We still had to wear our mask on the floor even when we were speaking. And sometimes that was really hard to hear hear much of the debate. So I think we have to be role models and get ready for what otherwise, it's gonna be a tough session. I mean, we patted, on our, <laughs> patted ourselves on the back when we did Cine DA. Uh, we did uh, have the budget balance, but you know who whose money that came from is from the federal funds that, that really saved right, the day. Right. Uh, we got people injected. I think we did a, we're doing a pretty good job in terms of promoting the public health. I really feel bad we didn't do more on the small businesses. We kind of threw them a lifeline. It was a bit short, filled with red tape. We're still kind of wrestling with maybe 30 to 40% of our businesses not going back and hiring people. As we speak, we got 70,000 unemployed. Uh, we're going to have well. a deficit. 
Next year is well, going to be a trial, a real trial. Well, let's hope that next year we will have better news coming out of the legislature for small businesses and for yes. employers. Uh, yeah. But in the meantime, one of the great uh, people ought to know that you were just recently appointed to the East West Center Board, where I happily uh, serve. Where you and, happen to be, yes. Yeah, and uh, we've had a few meetings. Well, give me like a two-minute version of where you, what you feel Hawaii could do that would be a benefit to the greater Pacific, not just the state of Hawaii. Oh, you, you really want me to get in my Peace Corps idealism and naive? Yeah, like I want to show that under that Republican <laughs> veneer, there is a lurking <laughs> activist, you know? But those who remember when there was an advertiser and there was a Buck Buckwald and I forget the other guy who said, in the year 2000, we should have a ambition for making Hawaii the Geneva of the Pacific, where we solve conflicts, where we bring people together. We share with Ho'oponopono and, and do the things that we can do at the East West Center. To me, the East West Center is the epitome of, of mutual understanding between what otherwise 190 countries, multiple languages. And it's, it's a great place for students in their young intellectual phases of, of development to know who America is, is and what America is about and then what other countries are about. So I think we've got it in Hawaii as kind of a well-kept secret. And it's an honor to be in, 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 the, in the governor's board of governors with you, governor. But it's where we got to get more known and more engaged in our community. We, we, I mean, at the legislature, I, I would think more people probably in Palau know more about the East West Center than, than we Well, you know what was shocking was that statistic where we used to have 4,000 people on scholarship, and now we only have two. And, yes. Uh, and, and uh, you know, I think that's something both you and I uh, feel that, we, that needs to be worked Can I on. underline that one? Do you know how many China has of the Pacific alone? No. Thousand, one thousand, was it? I think it was 1,000 or 10,000. One of the other uh, State Department appointees said that they have. We have two, and they've got either 1,000 or 10. I mean, it's huge. We're, we're, we're not carrying our own. We're not carrying our weight at all. So it's, it's rather unfortunate that we have this great study, uh, live together, work together, and we just don't seem to get, uh, as compared to the Fulbright, for example, they get a, a budget. Uh, Governor of 120 million. Yeah, and we we're lucky when we get 19 that. million. We're jumping. I think, uh, I think we got to have you back for another show. So I will tell you, to oh, maybe committed. I to talk too much. Center. No, it's uh, we are done, and I want to thank you so much, Representative Ward, for for agreeing to be here to uh, talk to us about what's going on, uh, not only in the legislature, but about Hawaii's role in the Pacific Asian Rift. So thank you, Governor thank you. Aloha. Aloha.